Hello, Pamela. Hey, Fraser. How are you doing? Doing well. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, SpaceX. That's all I've been thinking about. SpaceX didn't land safely. Correctly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's funny because when you're reading a lot of the of the articles that are out there were very much like SpaceX uh, crashes. Not quite. Right? But it crashed in the same way that all rockets crash after they've done their job of getting a payload to space. And but so it in this did it case, in the exactly predictable place. I mean, he, so so yeah, they didn't fully succeed, but they hit the barge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so and apparently the problem was that they hadn't put enough hydraulic fluid in, and so based on all the kinds of crosswinds that were going on, they didn't have enough. Uh, just hydraulics to steer it to the point that it could actually make a nice safe landing. So it was steering for a while and then it ran out of hydraulics and then it just it couldn't steer anymore and yeah. and then proceeded to crash. So uh, that and, and apparently that's easy to fix and you, you know he's putting twice the hydraulic fluid on the next they're putting twice the fluid on the next launch. So they should have plenty of hydraulic fluid to be able to uh, to to make this work. But they so. did hit the broad side of the barge. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, and and if it was ground, like if it had been the the ground the way it was supposed to, back on you know back at Kennedy Space Center, if they just returned back to the landing pad, they could have hit within a one kilometer target zone. It's the trying to hit a exact bullseye floating on the ocean that was the the it was a little beyond them, but they'll get it. So it, it was the hydraulic heater. Yeah. Oh, and if you missed it, uh, we had a great episode of the Weekly Space Hangout on Friday. We had uh, Andy Weir from The Martian join us. It was so much fun. I, was, I, I have to admit, I need to go back and watch that when I was in the midst of doing far too many things. Yeah, Andy's an absolute natural, so uh, he, awesome. he, he can join us anytime. Anytime he wants to join us on the uh, Weekly Space Hangout, he's always welcome. Uh, and if you haven't read The Martian, go read it. I command it. And the Audible book is also very good, so, so if you don't good. have the time to sit and read, read while you're doing your laundry, driving your car, on your exercise, whatever, it's it's worth the listen or the paper read. Yeah. All right, so for those of you who aren't aware what on earth it is you have stumbled into, this is an episode of Astronomy Cast. Uh, we are going to begin a ragtag series of uh, shows on uh, exoplanet hunting missions. And telescopes. Yeah, and telescopes and, and methodologies and the people, the heroes behind the Okay, now the you're science. adding stuff I didn't know about, but okay. <laughs> the, the, all right. Um, that's what I do. I, yes, I pointlessly is. speculate. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, we'll record for about 20, I, you know, 26, 28 minutes, and then we'll stick around and answer your questions about space and astronomy. Not just the topic at hand, but really anything that pops into your fevered imagination. So uh, store up your best singers. Uh, okay, great. Are you ready to record? I, I believe so. All right. I am pressing record. Oh, whoa, okay. Okay, fine. No, I no, unpressed no, record. No, Sorry. I pressed record now. No, I'm good. Dang it, I'm now recording. I have to go back. Okay. I have pressed record. It is recording. It is mono and everything else that you ever dreamed of. Hi, Preston. I am also still recording. Excellent. All right. Let's roll. I'm a little sick, so I'm a little, I'm a little more gravelly than usual. Uh, Astronomy Cast, episode 364, Coro. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos. We help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, uh, except for the fact that the SpaceX launch didn't uh, work properly. They didn't land on the barge softly. And uh, so I still I was, count it as a success. Total success, absolutely. Yeah, they landed on a barge. They got they hit a barge with a rocket, which, you know, 
I think incremental advancement. Yeah, yeah. Next time, don't hit the barge so hard with the rocket. Yes. Yeah, but uh, kudos to uh, Elon Musk and the rest of the SpaceX team. We are totally rooting for you. We are pro rockets landing where they take off again. If anyone wants to know if we have a bias, it is that. Or on a barge. We're also okay with them landing on a barge yeah. where they didn't take off. No, but that's the goal, right? The goal yeah. is to land back where you started. And that, and we have absolutely have that as a bias. We are pro, big, reusable rocket. So, uh, Okay, cool. All right, so before NASA's Kepler mission searched for exoplanets using the transit method, there was the European Corot mission launched in 2006. It was said to search for planets with short orbital periods and find solar oscillations in stars. It was an incredibly productive mission and the focus of today's show. And I think I may try to pronounce it. Please. So uh, so it's the convection, rotation, and tr planetary transit is the English version. And uh, let me try the French. Convection, rotation, et transit planétaire. Sort of. So, um, and this is the Corot mission launched by the European Space Agency and the French Space Agency, which is pretty cool. So, uh, what was this mission? It, it was essentially the first spacecraft that was dedicated to studying uh, transits of planets as well as astroseismology. Uh, so what it was looking for was very subtle variations in the detected brightness of stars. They had four CCD detectors on board, uh, two of which were, de were dedicated to looking at stars that were basically what you'd see with a good pair of binoculars, roughly magnitude 11 to 16, um, really good binoculars. And using the just bigger than 10 inch telescope on board this this spacecraft and the size of this is what just boggles my mind it, it's 27 centimeters this this little tiny telescope made extraordinarily precise measurements that um, made it the first anything to detect a rocky world so holy cow <laughs> Detecting a, hot, a rocky world, and so uh, and so, what I guess sort of back up a bit, you know, who made it? Where did it get launched from? What's the sort of history of the mission itself? It's it's very much a European mission. The majority of the funding, as you said, did come from the French Space Agency. Uh, other nations were involved. The European Space Agency as a whole was involved. Belgium being one of the other primary uh, collaborators. It got lunch. It got launched. It got launched like so many spacecraft uh, from the Bakadrome in the in Russia. Uh, sorry, the Bakadrome, the Bikin, the Cosmodrome, Cosmodrome. Yeah. in Kazakhstan, and um, it's one that just orbited the Earth, pointed out of the disk of the orbit of the Earth, um, and would look at one chunk of sky for several months rotate, uh, look at another chunk of sky for a shorter amount of time, then look at another chunk of sky for a longer period of time. And it only did this for a while though because this is a mission that while it outlived what they designed it for, it did suffer from um, multiple small problems as it yes. went. Uh well, let, let's talk about the problems, and then we'll come back around and talk a bit about the science. So let's talk about the actual, like, mission operations. So as you said, it launched from the, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. It, uh, you know, started out quite well. First light in January 2007. Yep. So, so all was going good from that January 2007 um, until March of 2009. And in March of 2009, unfortunately, half the electronics for the sensors decided we're no longer going to tell you what we're seeing. The, the way the spacecraft was engineered, it had four CCDs, two of which were used for looking at astroseismology. They were slightly out of focus to, present, to prevent any saturation from occurring and uh, highly sensitive, dedicated usually to one primary star with several other stars in the field. 
And then the other pair of CCDs were used to look for exoplanet transits. So th these systems uh, simply looked at as many stars in the field at a time as they could, taking very pr precise photometry. Now, the way the electronics were rigged, half of the electronics were on one astroseismology and one exoplanet CCD pair, and the other half were on the other pair. The data processing unit for the first pair, so data processing unit one, failed in March of 2009. They tried all sorts of stuff to try and get it back, couldn't rescue it, and after this occurred, this effectively halved the amount of science that the spacecraft was capable of doing at any one given moment. As part of wanting to rescue the amount of science that it was capable of doing, they decided to, to change their mission operations from being a long period of time on a field, short period of time. They, they changed that rotation to being strictly three months on a field, three months on a field, three months on a field. The reason that they did this was so that they could do astroseismology on more targets and at the same time it did make it harder for them to find exoplanets. Now, I mean, the mission was only supposed to originally last for two and a half years, so it pretty much got its the full mission that, as they had planned it. But it, right. it, but it's one of the situations where it actually did sort of start to die when, at the end of the mission duration, as sort of expected. Unlike when we think about Spirit, right, which was supposed to go for thir for ninety days and went for a thousand days, and we still get upset that it died. Yeah, we still get upset that it died. <laughs> the Kuro mission was supposed to go for, uh, was it three years, I think? and Two and, and a half years initially. So they, they got data from both sets of sensors from January of 2007. So all of 2007, all of 2008. They started it on 2009 and borked electronics. So they made it most of the way to the two and a half year mark. But then they were able to keep going with the other set of, of sensors that were on board. So while they halved their field of view, they more than doubled the length of their spacecraft's mission where they kept going on and uh, taking data all the way into, well, in, until it finally completely died um, in June, uh, sorry, yeah, in June of 2013. Right, that's right. It, I think the computers died in 2012, and they tried to, to communicate with it, and they gave up in uh, in June 2013. Right. So it's it's a mission that that did a lot of good. It it made a lot of discoveries, and it's one where we can actually say. It's still reporting science. It's still doing new science simply because there's so much data in the archives from it. But we're actually coming at it while it's it's still orbiting the planet, but it's on a 45-year path to destruction in our atmosphere. I I I, I tried to do some research to figure out how that worked out because they like when they knew that it was dead, they put it into a lower orbit to burn up in the atmosphere. But so you're saying that actually the way the the path is because I couldn't find when it had burned up. It it hasn't. That it that's, hasn't burned up. No, so it's gonna take it at least another forty years before it comes plunging through our atmosphere. So it's it's on a slow decay. They didn't have a lot of fuel to put it into a fast decay orbit, um, but that's okay. We can slowly destroy things occasionally. And it's it's not that big, so it's not like it's gonna be one of these school bus sized. Uh, spacecraft coming back through the atmosphere. No, and and that that's one of the neat things about this is I mean it's essentially your backyard telescope attached to solar panels and a big sun shield, and um, it only cost about 160 million euros, which for a space telescope is kind of awesome. Yeah, no kidding. All right, so let's talk about the you know it had two main missions, right? Finding planets and checking out stars. So let's talk about those sort of and, and what amazing discoveries it did make. So, so the one that everyone is generally most excited about is it discovered planets. Um, 
It was using the the standard transiting mesh method where you look for uh, light to dip down ever so slightly and to do it in a way where it goes down, flattens off, and goes back up. If the dip in the star's light is more V-shaped, that usually means that it's a stellar pulsation of some sort. And there's other things, unfortunately, that can mimic the effects of a transiting planet. And Crow was one of the first ones to actually detect brown dwarfs orbiting around other stars, pretending to be exoplanets. Uh, and it, of course, like every other transiting mission, uncovered binary star after binary star after binary star. But its most interesting discoveries uh, were probably the Crow 7 system where there's multiple uh, transiting plant. well there's a plant. sorry Preston, I'm making this one hard for you to edit. One of the most interesting systems uh, that Crow worked on was the Crow 7 system. This is a system that has one transiting planet in addition to other planets that were found during follow-up Doppler work. And Crow 7b is really the first super Earth that's been discovered. Uh, at the time that it was discovered it was the smallest confirmed planet with 1.58 Earth diameters. Now that we've got an... lots of them but that was the first smallest. That was pretty cool. That was back in February of 2009 and so here we were just starting to begin the age of space-based transit discovery and we're already finding rocky worlds. Now admittedly this is a rocky world that you really don't want to be on. Um, it's, it's orbiting a bit closer to its star than one might wish for. Uh, it's probably actually molten on one side. But it told us that Earth wasn't the only rocky world out there well, of course, we knew about Mercury, Venus, and Mars, but our four rocky worlds weren't the only ones out there. We finally had confirmation of other ones. That is awesome. Uh, what are some other interesting worlds that they turned up? Um, they... Sorry, scanning through diff information on my screen. You don't have this stuff just, just in your head? No, no. It This requires getting the names correct. I'll give you a hint. They all start with Caro. Yeah, I know. Okay, so there's Caro 4. So additional... Uh, sorry, Preston. I'm making this hard for you. Uh, so in, in addition to Caro 7B being so exciting because it's so small and so hot, there's also Caro 4B and 5B, which are just weird. Um, they're Jupiter sized, um, but their sizes don't actually match quite with what was anticipated. So we're not entirely sure how that happens, and um, it's one of those things that planetary folks are still trying to sort out. Uh, and I know Crow, as you said, it turned up a like a super planet one with a mass of uh, 22 times Jupiter, that was Kuro 3b, and they weren't sure whether that was a brown dwarf or a planet. And and that's definitely one of the ones that, that's been more perplexing in terms of, well, uh, the IAU ever so politely provided us with a very strict definition of what's a planet within our own solar system, but it didn't define where you start breaking things apart at the top of the size spectrum. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of confusing stuff in its list, but where it really made its mark was finding smaller objects than had previously been found. Up till then, we'd done some transiting searches from the Earth, we'd done a lot of Doppler search detections, but with Crow, we started finding Jupiter-sized stuff, we started finding sub-Jupiter-sized stuff, we started finding things the size of Neptune, smaller than Saturn. All of these smaller objects, while unfortunately still on tiny orbits in general, um, changed our perspective on, yes, there are going to be things other than hot Jupiters out there, and really add a lot of confidence and hope to what future missions would be able to find and the possibility of finding another Earth out there on an Earth-like orbit. 
Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the list of, of planets with Corot, you only get about, you get up to like Corot 27, uh, and there's some multiple planets in the different systems. But And those are the confirmed ones. Those there's are another confirmed. Hundred, there's another hundred or so candidates that are slowly getting plugged through. Yeah, no, I, I, was, I, I guess my document says 600 additional candidate exoplanets screened for confirmation. So... And this is where I guess they, they will eventually get some of these other spacecraft to, to take a look at it. Um, so, so we've talked a bit about the planets, and, and again, like just imagine, like I always imagine Kuro 7b, and I remember when that one was first announced and we reported on it, that you know, you've got this world that's incredibly close to its, to its star, it's, uh, it's tidally locked to the star, and half of this world must just be rolling lava. That's just, you know, an ocean of lava directed towards the star, and then on the backside, it's just water uh, and ice. I mean, that's the amazing thing yeah. is, uh, depending on whose models you look at, they think that that world that's molten on one side um, may be capable of supporting ice on the other side at just 50 Kelvin. That that's an amazing. Uh, dichotomy wow. to just try and think about. I would love to see that world. Can you just imagine like flying over and just seeing the, the difference in terrain as you go from one half of the world to the other? <sighs> okay. All right. So we talked <laughs> about planets. Let's talk about the, the star discoveries because it made as many really interesting discoveries about stars as well. And and with stars, what it was looking at was how do stars intrinsically vibrate? How do they pulsate when uh, various activities inside of them uh, set them oscillating? Stars, including our sun, have a variety of different uh, things going on, they don't just casually sit there burning and emitting light at a steady pace. We are used to with our sun, thinking of sunspots, thinking of the uh, solar magnetic cycle, but what we forget about is it's actually kind of jiggling like a soap bubble and these jiggles build up various oscillations that can be seen in, in how it emits light at very low levels of change. What happens is the energy that would normally go into heating up the surface instead goes into expanding the star through the pulsation. So you're, you're taking that same amount of energy and turning it into kinetic energy rather in, than into thermal energy. And we can see this by looking at stars in multiple wavelengths of light and comparing is it getting darker more in this color than in this color? With a binary system or a transiting system, you'd expect all the colors to go down as you're blocking a percentage of the star's light. With a pulsation, you expect to see a temperature change, which means that each of the colors responds differently to what the star is doing. And I wish that, you know, if you're listening to this as an audio podcast, it's hard to really get across the really cool shapes that these stars can do, the sort of modes that they vibrate. And so you're just going to have to use your imagination for the difference. Because it's not just expand, contract, expand, contract. They can, you know, they've been proposed that they might like bulge out in the middle or sort of wobble in really kind of strange ways. And, and there's some amazing animations out there on the inter internet, animated GIFs in some yeah. cases. And the, the real thing to think about is we're used to thinking of things oscillating in, in essentially one mo mode where they get shorter and bulge out at the middle, uh, then get thinner and bulge out at the top. And that one, mo one mode situation is the most simplistic. But stars don't necessarily have just one, mo one mode, and you can divide the star up in multiple different ways and there's different types of oscillations that can occur as well and depending on the types of ops the types of oscillations and the combination of oscillations you can essentially end up with stripes of different temperatures quartiles a whole variety of different geometries of how the star is affected through these well seismic events and, and that's really what it is, right? I mean, it's astro-seismology. These are earthquakes in the sun, right? Sunquakes. And watching how they ripple through these stars. And the fact that, that they can do this from so far away is just, again, mind-bending. 
And this is actually an extremely useful thing because just as if you blow into multiple soda bottles, you'll be able to, if you do enough maths, uh, get at the size of the soda bottle based on the tone that comes out of it. You can get at the size of the star based on the type of oscillations. Different sized cavities are capable of different types of oscillations that are specific to the size of the cavity. And you can hit harmonics. This is like when you jump an octave on a woodwind instrument or if you're really good if you jump the octave blowing into that soda bottle. That's a different type of resonance, but it still is very specific to the cavity. With stars, we can get at the precise, as precise as our observations allow us, the precise sizes of these stars based on the observed oscillations. Oh, okay. So it's sort of like another way, like how, how mirror variables let you get at the inherent luminosity of a star, like how bright it really is. With this, if you can measure the oscillations, that'll give you a sense of just how big the star is. And and it's it's very similar physics. In both cases, you're dealing with pulsations, and the pulsations is representative of, well, the size of the cavity that's pulsating. And so, I mean, any of these standard measuring sticks, I guess in this case, instead of it being a distance stick, it's a, you know, you're able to to measure the the size of the object is is super useful for astronomers to, to try and get a sense of what it is they're looking looking at out there in the you know in the universe. Get getting at the sizes of stars is definitely one of the most difficult things we have to try and figure out how to do. And this is a instrumentation wise very difficult way to do it. You have to have very precise measurements. But while you need your instruments to be finely tuned, finely built, uh, as this little spacecraft proved, you don't need them to be large or expensive. Now, as we mentioned, I mean, this was the first real spacecraft sent to do the transit method. I think Hubble had been used, or Spitzer had been used a couple of times. To... Hubble and Spitzer had both been used yeah. in different ways. They'd been used more to look for direct detections, especially Spitzer. It, gets, it still gets used as a follow-up spacecraft. And then, of course, there's Canada's MOST telescope, which I think yes. had launched a little earlier, and it had done some of this work as well. But this was a nice, dedicated, pretty serious mission, and it served as the precursor to other missions that came after. And I guess the most famous one that we're comfortable with is Kepler. Exactly. And and sadly, both Kepler and Corot bit the dust at about the same time. So, well, they're, they're bringing back Kepler now, but... Um, they both suffered electronics failures in different ways at about the same point in time. And so uh, for a while, scientists basically had to sit there digging through the archives and catching up on data waiting to be processed rather than waiting for data to come down. Um, but uh, it left a, a hole in our ability to get new data that Kepler's working to try and find ways to fill in. Yeah, and the ones that are really exciting, I, I don't know if you put these in the in the queue for future episodes, we're going to talk about TESS, yes. the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, that's going to be crazy, that's going to be launching in two years, um, and then there's the PLATO, yes. and that's going to be launching, uh, oh, 2024. So we, we have lots of different things, and we're also going to be looking at the Earth-based um, spectrographs and that's the thing is people forget we have spacecraft like Crow and Kepler that are doing these amazing transit observations but that's only half the story when you observe a transit there's still the possibility that you're looking at a pulsation that you just goofed there's still the possibility that it's really a binary star and so you have to look at the light very carefully to decouple all of the different things you might be seeing to verify, yes, this is a planet. So here on Earth, we do follow up with a uh, spectrograph like HARPS, which we'll be talking about, uh, as well as there's the Sophia Shell spectrograph and um, a whole myriad of others. And we'll work our way through all of them over time. Yeah, and don't forget the terrestrial planet find. Oh, right. That was never, yeah. Yeah, it's canceled. But this is, I mean, this is crazy, right? Like, we are, here we stand in the early 2015 uh, within striking distance of being able to observe 
Earth-sized worlds orbiting other stars and being able to eventually observe their atmospheres. That, that this is no longer a scientific question. It is purely a budget issue. Like if we can, people can gather together the money and get the right size telescope up in space or observing from the surface of Earth, we will find out an answer to this question, uh, are we alone? to within a thousand light years or within, you know, some reasonable expanse of space, we'll be able to really get a, a pretty good answer to that question. And and it's really looking like several percent of stars have planetary systems orbiting around them. So we need we need that combination of more transiting missions to find the percentage that's aligned correctly so that we can see the transit. And we need more spectrographs capable of, like Spitzer does, uh, looking to see what is the composition of the planet's atmospheres and capable of looking for any additional planets that may be in these systems. Well, and we need more coronagraphs to block out the light of the bright stars and be able to reveal the images of the planets themselves. So this is, this is an exciting time. I, like, I hope that the people who are listening to this show are, are realize, I think, that we are at this place, that we are right on the cusp within a couple of decades, I think, of, of being able to have the capability to answer, to, to gather scientific data about this question. And uh, we'll be here with you to, to sort of learn it as we go. And, and I also just really want to understand why is it that Crow 11B and 2B are so much bigger than they should be. Uh, physics doesn't allow this. So this is a spacecraft that opened doors to discovering new worlds, quite literally. It helped us uncover the sizes of stars. It did amazing science and gave us these two really weirdo objects that theorists can't explain. And I love baffling theorists. Yeah. <laughs> Take that, theorist. <laughs> explain this. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, well, thanks, Pamela. We'll talk Thank to you next you. week. Okay. Sorry, Preston. Oh. He's My brain to... just kept falling out because they're all crow something B. And my brain was just like too many numbers. Ah. Okay. Sorry, audience watching this live. You were watching the sausage get made. Yes. Okay. Saving my episode. Yeah, my this brain. is the part of the show where we bore you. <laughs> With our file-ness. Yeah. Okay. Q&A app. Okay, that's all saved. That's all safe. I'm going to make my transfer. And then... Good. Excellent. All right. Let's look and see if we got any questions. Hello, Todd Howard, Cecil Morgan, Jim Meeker, Nathaniel Sanchez, Thomas Traniker, Guido Bibra, Nancy Graziano. Thank you, everybody. There's a ton of Seb stuff. Dust Bunny. Michael Jobin. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Todd Howard notes, wow, incredible that such discoveries in science can be done with such a small telescope and a relatively low budget. This is this, you know, this is this idea. I used to see what the, the Canadian most telescope, I mean, it was like a $10 million budget. And yeah. it has done all kinds of things. So this is the situation that if you create a very specialized instrument to do one very specific job, it can make, it can do some pretty significant science results with that in that one specialization, but it's not great at doing other things. So, yeah, Michael Jobin is mentioning ion propulsion reaction thrusters. Unfortunately, those are such low power that they're really not what we need. Uh, what? They're they're proposing ways to fix things. Where? I'm looking in oh, the Q and A app. I know. Right? I see that. I see that. And more reaction yeah. wheels, people are noting. 
Yeah, for once, a mission didn't die because it ran out of reaction wheels. Why does anybody listen to me? Why does anyone listen to me? (laughs) Because you propose expensive things. Mm -mm. No way. More wheels. Just wheels. Just spinny wheels. It's cheap. My my phone's got one of them inside. Um, Okay. Will Gaia measure these types of oscillations? I believe so, and that's in our next episode. Cool. So, so we'll give you tune in next answer. week when I will know the answers to questions like these. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Thomas Tranaker says, uh, I cannot get over the idea that we keep finding planets. It's a big step for exploration. I wonder if we're going to find exocomets. I think we've already found them. We have found exo disks that yeah. comets could originate from, but seeing the individual objects, not so much. Yeah. Um, it, it's strangely easier to spot things like dense Kuiper belts and Oort clouds around other stars, just because the surface brightness is greater yeah. when you shrink the system down. So 11 stars have been found with exocomets, but they're not actually seeing the comets themselves, they're just seeing the the disk of material that is containing the comet. So, so there, done, F- solved, found. Next, um, what else we got? Uh, Will Idoni says, was there a leak in the hydraulics because it was u- uh, usually an enclosed system? I guess I must use a different system. So, no, as I understand for the SpaceX landing, they just didn't have enough hydraulics fluid in the yeah. in the landing system. So it just they just hadn't expected the number of the amount of course changes that would be required because the the hydraulics were what were sort of helping gimbal the motors back and forth as it was as it was coming back in for its landing, as well as I guess its flaps and the the landing struts. So it needed all this hydraulic fluid, and so the big lesson that they figured out is that it there was just more uh, more maneuvering that the rocket needed to make in order to line itself up to be able to land. Uh, Sev Dustbunny asks, how much work is SETI doing following up on these solar systems? Uh, some, and they didn't turn up any, there was a, actually just, they just announced that they listened to one of the Kepler worlds and didn't hear anything. And and what SETI's doing isn't confirming whether or not Kepler transits or Corot transits are actually planets via the Doppler signature. What they're doing instead is following up in the radio to see what can be learned that way. Yeah. So Kepler 116454b, which is a planet 180 light years away, or it's an orange dwarf star in the constellation Pisces, uh, the folks from the SETI Institute directed the Allen Telescope Array and tried to listen to this world, hoping to hear some kind of observation and some kind of signal, and they didn't. But, you know, they only searched for a short period of time. They only looked within a very specific range of frequency. You know, the chances that, that they were actually going to hear any signals from that world are pretty low, so... And they, it turns out they didn't. Oh, uh, Guido Bieber is noting, says, I also have to mention the German press was absolutely terrible with the SpaceX crash. It was all failed, crashed, destroyed from the headlines. It looked like the whole rocket had crashed into the ocean. So one thing I don't know, did they sink the barge? Nope, barge is fine. I've okay, just, that's yeah. that's what I thought. So I, why the dire? I Germans sank things the size of the barge and bigger over and over and over again during World War Two. It didn't sink the barge, so it wasn't they that. They dropped a rocket of a... on a barge, and the barge was fine. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. No. It's I. You know. It's just. But I mean, you see this a lot, right? The people just. People who aren't in in the industry and understand the news and watch the incremental progress just don't have they don't have the right terms to use. They don't really understand. They haven't played enough Kerbal Space Program to really understand the uh, the orbits that were going on, and and so they just they don't get it, right? Yeah. 
And so, yeah, I mean, it was like, it was exactly like a normal, perfectly successful rocket launch. And then for its second mission, landing safely, it almost made it. So. There you go. Uh, John Gallant says, yeah, hydraulics was an open system. They just used it up. So. Uh... Jim Meeker notes regarding the SpaceX barge, I think they'll keep using it because when they start using the Falcon Heavy, the central core will have to land further out in the ocean. Certainly farther than the outer, the outer or the first stages will land. I think this is a good question, right? That, you know, that there is some fuel savings by landing your rocket on the barge downrange from where you took off as right. opposed to trying to guide back to the landing pad and land. So, so you know, who knows that that maybe they're going to find out that that in fact setting up these these landing barges out in the ocean is both safer for the human population around it, and also maybe more more cost effective. You know, like what if they have a a barge and then they have a a tractor right on the barge, and then the spacecraft just lands on the tractor perfectly you know, the crawler, and then the barge comes back to port, and then the crawler just drives off the barge and returns to the landing pad. Like, And if you can save a few tons of fuel that way, then that lets you get a high, a, you know, a higher uh, payload, a larger payload into space. Who knows? I mean, this is the fact that we're even considering these different options is such a great place to I be. I think you were the only one considering landing on a tractor. On a trailer, on a crawler. You know, I, how are you going to get your well, hitting the made... broad side of a barge? I'm good with. Yeah. Hitting a small movable, movable thing the size of like a squared semi truck. Not so good with. Yeah, or some kind of catcher, you know. So like the rocket comes down, and then these, then the thing just kind of claws up and just grabs the rocket nice and, and then later on when they get it to land, then they can just pick the whole thing up and move it like. You're All adding movable pieces at sea with crosswinds. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, Noel Rupenthal says, crashing a Kerbal Space Program is known as litho-breaking. I am a fantastic litho-breaker, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it when it involves a barge? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, just, it's landing. It's proper safe landing. Uh, but someone do a do a search for this. Uh, someone has actually done the Kerbal Space Program simulation of it, and that person is an absolute master. Because I can't believe how well they landed on this barge. Uh, and if you don't play Kerbal Space Program, shame on you. You have more free time than many of us. <laughs> Uh, Todd Howard says, SpaceX narrowed a rough 100-kilometer landing ellipse down to less than 100 meters. Okay, they scorched a barge, but that's a success to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. They didn't um, sink it. Yeah. Anything else? Now is your chance. Jim Meeker is reminding everyone that we have classes open for enrollment with Cosmo Academy right now. We have two classes open. Uh, one is on orbits and the other one is on small bodies. So the instructors are Dr. Matthew Francis and Dr. Sandy Springman? Yeah. Sandy Springman. I'm good with her first name. I always struggle with the last name. Yeah. Um, what are they teaching? Do you know? I I just said they're teaching oh. orbits. Matthew is teaching orbits, and Sandy is teaching minor bodies. Oh, there we go. Sandy's gonna be working for the Osiris Rex mission. Yes. We got the inside track on return. We already did because we had Hana Takari. I don't, know if, I don't know if Hannah sent me a postcard from the Arecibo Observatory. I don't think so. So all I'm well, saying, we got the we got the inside track on the Cyrus Rex. We already did. 
Okay. Jones bought we, me beer, so that makes it more. Okay, real well to then me. we've got double the inside track on the Osiris Rex mission. I, I, I don't think we'll get our own private chunk of the uh, asteroid, though. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Because um, that's what they're going to do. They're going to pick up a chunk of asteroid and return, return it, and return it to home. Yes. All right. Uh, anything else? Now is your chance. That's all I see. Okay, so friendly reminder, uh, subscribe to Astronomy Cast over at YouTube. We're now our own separate channel, uh, and we'd love to have you following us. And if you haven't seen them over on the CosmoQuest YouTube channel, which still has a ridiculous uh, name, uh, we have a new trailer video uh, showcasing all of the awesome that came out with our full site upgrade, which we launched on New Year's. Yay! You you worked so hard over the holidays to get all the stuff done. So so everyone should go and check all the stuff out that Pamela did. She was uh, she was you're getting a lot of I'm not here emails back from her when you tried yeah. to send her stuff. I, I put up a message that said I'm working on things other than email and did yeah. a ton of programming which made me I cannot tell you how happy I was to do something other than grant writing. Yeah, exactly. That is always the hilarious part that that uh, I'm the one with the computer science degree and you're the better programmer. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, this was super fun. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Pamela, for, uh, for as always, another year of uh, co-hosting Astronomy Cast. It's super fun. Here's to the best 2015 ever. May it be more scientific. Yep. Uh, and if you haven't already, follow Pamela on Twitter. Star. And fro follow Fraser. He's yeah. F. Kane. She's Star Strider. And uh, we'll see you all next week.